So let's talk about, you know, how it all started. I mean, you are a Grammy winning writer, producer, musician. And when you read that, you've got names in there like Eminem, Pink, Celine Dion. That is like, oh my God, this is Max <laughs> Martin. And this is, you know, this is, these are the biggest producers in the world. So, I mean, you know, I could, I could ask the question, how, how was it working with Eminem or Celine Dion or Pink? But let's start at the beginning. When you were growing up, did you like to write things down, songs and things like that? How did you realize that you had this talent? Um, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I always, always writing stuff down, you know, constantly um, to the deep irritation of all my friends and family. Uh, but I mean, the honest answer was I was trying to impress a girl I liked. That's right. It's pretty, pretty cliche, but yeah. And, and so, yeah, so I, I picked up a guitar and sort of managed to learn a couple of chords that my stepbrother showed me. And then I wrote her the song and I played it for her. And I'll never forget what she said, which was, you are awful and please oh my god oh it was i'm sure it was a terrible song yeah no she was that that is really bad oh. and you never sing again i mean it was it was it was pretty wound that's, that's but... great for the ego that's great you know that's like <laughs> oh yeah i got her not and i can't even sing i mean that's like oh, the yeah. worst slap you can get in the face it was a good start i think it prepares you for yeah. the realities of the music industry so <laughs> how old were you there eric uh, 13. Right. So I, I imagine it did get better. Slowly. Yes. Slowly. But looking back on it, I, I had a quality that I think, uh, I mean, a lot of my, my friends and colleagues, I think all have, which was a rather unreasonable belief in my own ability that I was, I don't know, I just kind of thought I'm just going to keep on doing this until I get good at it, because it's the only thing I want to do. I mean, I've said to mm -hmm. people before that, you know, if, if you could see yourself being happy doing something other than music, then yes. do that thing. <laughs> uh, yes, work in a library, be a, be, you know, go to the police, yeah. uh, go to the tax office, something like Damn that. Damn on the uh, weekend, you know? Yes. <laughs> But for so, me, for, like, I mean, I never felt it was a choice. I mean, I just always knew this is what I wanted to do. And you didn't get the girl. I did not get the girl. You did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> do you still, do you, do you still talk to her? You are writing on Facebook or anything like that? Or is yeah, that yeah, no, so we're still fun? friends. No, we're oh, still great. friends. great. Yeah. Did she at least admit this time that you did get better over the years? Oh, it's a running joke. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. I believe that is. Yeah, right. When I got the first Grammy, I got a text message from her saying like, good thing you didn't listen to me. <laughs> Yes, I was just thinking that myself, but, but for, let's, we'll, not, we'll get to that part in a minute. So what happened then from being 13, slowly getting better? When was the first time you realized, wow, I actually can do that? You know, you, you said just, just a minute ago, you believed in yourself and continuously worked and worked and worked. When was the first sign that you realized, wow, I can do it? That's a good question. Um... I mean, by the time I was 15, because I've always been tall, I was lying to booking agents about my age and, and getting shows. And, really? and yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm 18. Look at my beard. Oh, Look oh, yeah. how tall I am. And yeah, like, they, oh, they, they weren't asking too closely either. I think it just needed to be plausible. Um, All right. It's a bit so, you cliche know, half comic, but you know, it sounds like really like an American uh, 60 year old trying to get into a club. I've got the fake ID. That's what you learn from the television shows. You know, it seems like that. I'm 18. I can do everything. Oh, exactly. It was, are you 18? I was like, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I am. Here's my fake ID. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I sort of started doing those gigs and I, I was doing a ton of um, uh, busking as well, just to make some extra money. Right. Uh, and so, you know, slowly, I don't think there was any one sort of big moment, um, but, you know, sort of day by day, things were definitely getting better. I think maybe when other people wanted to start playing with me and playing my songs, because I, I, before I picked up a guitar, I was already playing in bands, but I was a drummer. Um, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I played. So you, you, you have the feeling for the beat. At least you have, you have that. Because oh, yeah. as, as soon as the drummer comes and he says, are you not listening to me? Why are you playing like six beats in a bar uh, and I'm playing four? What's wrong with you? I mean, I've, I've had that before that the guitar people, they like to jam, but when it's down to the beat, they have their problems. 
Oh yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I started, the only thing I ever actually took lessons for was drums and that I okay. did from seven to 13. So I played in other people's bands, but when, you know, suddenly people were, cause I was constantly saying like, Hey, will you listen to this song I wrote? And when suddenly bands were saying like, Oh, actually, you know what? We should play that song. And like, yeah, I'll play in your band. And then pretty soon I was singing my own songs. I mean, that sort of started, but um, I got signed to EMI publishing uh, for a development deal when I was 17. And Great. so that I think was the <clears throat> moment where I suddenly thought, oh my God, all this bluster is sort of paid off. So what, what is a publishing deal? What, what, is, what, what happens there? You sign a contract and you promise them to write so many songs or what is a publishing deal? No, so it, it was, I don't know if they do them the same way out here, but it was a co-pub with EMI where everything I wrote during the contract period, they owned 50% of the publishing for right uh but being a development deal they you know they gave me an advance and they also i mean i had the, i mean the guy who signed me is a guy named mike mccarty who's a legend in, in canada uh and he became my mentor and so as right. a part of this i would also get a lot of advice they set up sessions so i could work with other people i'd go in once a week and play him my new songs and he would critique them and, and he's a guy who's who's fascinating because he actually came up the old school way. He was an assistant to a producer named Bob Ezrin. And so he was around mm -hmm. at the studio when they were making The Wall when he was, you know, in his early 20s. Right. And a ton of classic records. And then he sort of slowly got into the business side and moved up. So, so I mean, this is a man who really understands composition and music. Right. Um, but th there, there is a funny story about that where I managed to get a, a meeting with him. This is my audition. And I went in with a guitar, sold banged up thing and I started playing in my first song and I could just see I mean you can just you know when somebody does not like the music they're hearing <laughs> oh, this is gonna, I, I don't want to hear this I, don't, I, I know where this is going yeah yeah and so I could see he didn't like the song and I thought oh god as soon as I finish this song he's gonna tell me to leave so from years of busking I just went into the next song and I could tell he didn't like that either so I went into oh, the next god. one and I kept on playing and at some point I cut my arm quite badly on the guitar. Seriously? Yeah, and I started bleeding quite profusely and then played for about another, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, just bleeding all over his white carpet, at oh which point God. he said, okay, stop. I'm signing you. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And then he told me years later, I really did hate your music, but I figured if you were going to lose a pint of blood in my office, oh God. you'd get better. <laughs> Yeah. So the real reason you got that signing is he it's because he felt sorry for you, but he probably thought if he's got that much stigma, if he's gonna if he's gonna if he's, if he's gonna die in front of me to prove what he can, I'll sign this guy. That's the only sign I need that he is really interested in in, in getting there. Yeah, that was it. That was it. He knew I would be dedicated. Right. So. When you like sit down and, and play on your guitar, you, do you do the melody first and then think about the lyrics or do you do the lyrics and then think about the melody or do you just do the melody and let somebody else write the lyrics? How do you do it for yourself? What's, what's your, what your recipe? It really depends. If I'm writing by myself, it can happen any way. Sometimes I'll just be strumming and a mel melody will come to me or I'll be walking down the street and a mel melody will pop into my head. And then that's okay. fun to try a lot of different chords um, or I'll have a line, you know, just a lyric or a concept idea. But what's really interesting to me is when you're writing with other people, because there I do have a bit of a process or a method. And of course, co-writing is so common these days. So I think it's, it's smart to, to have an idea of how to do it. And so for me, I'm lucky enough that I, you know, I said I played drums, I, I program, I, I know how to produce, I do lyrics, I sing, I play the instruments, all this sort of stuff. So what I like to do is figure out what the weaknesses are in the room, sort of what's missing. Okay. Because I feel a sign of a good co-writer, and especially the way to get the best song out of a session, is to let everybody play to their strengths. There's no point in co competing with anybody. So I try not to go in with an idea of I'm going to I'm going to do the top line today, or I'm going to do this today because, you know, sometimes that works. And I know people that do one thing and they do that one thing very, very well. And if I'm in a room with them, I'm going to let them do that thing. Okay. And I will just try and compliment them as well as possible. So 
you know, when you write like hit songs, and let, let's get to the biggest songs that you've written, um, how many people were involved in like Eminem or in Pink and Celine Dion? Would you say that it was you, you were the, the giver or were you just someone who worked with the team? Well, okay, with, actually with all of those songs, um, except for maybe one or two Eminem, because I think I've done seven Eminem songs or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the vast majority of those, and it was the same with Pink, come to think of it, were written in Toronto with my main co-writer, uh, this woman named Liz Rodriguez. So what we had been doing, it'd been, we'd get together maybe two, three times a week and just sort of record these ideas. We were in this group called the New Royals with this guy, uh, DJ Khalil and Chin and Jetty. Yeah. And Khalil is the one, he, he signed to Dr. Dre. So he had, I'd never dreamed of writing for other people. It was really not a okay. goal of mine. Um, but he had sort of said, hey, you know, I might have an opportunity. I want you guys come up with some ideas. And so with those songs, I mean, somebody like Eminem, for example, he writes all of his own parts, right? So what we were really doing is coming up with the concept, the chorus, melody, and lyric, and then the instrumentation. Then we'd send them over to Khalil and he would produce it and add the drums. Um, so yeah, I mean, the instigation of all those ideas basically happened in a, in a little apartment in downtown Toronto with just me and Liz. Just, you know. Right, and then you sent the lyrics and, and, and the melody uh, onto Eminem or to Pink. What happened there? I mean, I imagine they said, oh, that's great, we'll take it. And you're like, well, okay, <laughs> Eminem's just like taking a song of mine. Let's go out for a beer. It can't have happened like that. That must have been like, oh my God, I don't believe this. I bet he had to read the mail eight, you know, 18 or 19 times. Is this true? Am I really writing a song for, for Eminem or for Pink or for Celine Dion? What did that feel like? Well, Eminem was the first big cut I ever got. And uh it uh, yeah it was really surreal i honestly it felt so weird especially because i'm not i don't come from a hip-hop background so i mean it was just particularly strange that this is this had somehow happened especially given the fact that it was a song called won't back down and mm -hmm. i had no interest in in producing or knowing how to record anything at the time so i actually like had like an old macbook and I just put it on the ground with GarageBand in front of an amp and recorded the guitar parts through the built-in mic on the MacBook. Oh my God. <laughs> and that's what's on the record. I mean, I just, I couldn't believe it. But yeah, I was, I was living in this tiny little apartment. I, you know, I remember it coming out and that was really amazing. And there was a thing in the, in the newspaper about it. And like my face was in the newspaper and I couldn't believe that. But the real moment that was crazy was sitting in my apartment and hearing a car go by and they oh, and the song was playing yeah oh, great i mean of course the reference I, I wouldn't have known the reference at the time because it didn't exist but it really felt like a black mirror kind of moment like i kind of kept yeah, on yeah, yeah, the other yeah. shoe to drop like am i gonna wake up you know and then it continued and continued and continued did you get to meet eminem personally did you get to jam no, together I, i've never met eminem no, I've, I've worked with Dr. Dre quite a lot, but uh, the thing with Eminem is that he does not leave Detroit if he can help it. Right. He's, he is a serious homebody for various reasons that I, I won't get into, but Fine. yeah. Yeah, he, he's, Eminem is, well, yeah, we were never in the same place at the same time, let's put it. Uh, so but, you don't have his mobile number. You can't call him up and say, <laughs> hey, Marshall, it's me. Yeah, well, people just call him M, actually. Um, okay. yeah, but yeah, but no, I mean, but having worked with Dr. Dre quite a bit was, it was a great opportunity for me. And yeah, I was just yeah. going to talk about that because I mean, that is one of the biggest, you know, names in the hip hop scene. Uh, you, as you said, I, I imagine you come from like a Rocky background and not from a hip hop background, Absolutely. but I mean, meeting Dr. Dre, that's just, that would be for me. I, I wouldn't care if he listened to my song or he didn't I, just meeting him will be like you know, wow, this is one of the biggest names in the, in the world. What was that like? Terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that, you know, scary. It's a bit like, oh my God, there's about 50 homies sitting around him and you come in and hello, I'm Eric, oh, yeah. I write songs 
Oh yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was very intimidating because also just the, the level of musicianship around this guy is astonishing. I mean, everybody who gets in there is just, you know, world-class. And so I kind of kept on looking around thinking, you know, is somebody going to figure out that I'm, I don't belong here, you know? Um, but then working with him was also amazing because he's a very instinctive. When I was ta talking earlier about gut, I mean, he's a guy that mm -hmm. just clearly trusts his own instincts. And uh, Khalil had told me this because he, he's, you know, known him for years that Dr. Yeah. Drake considers himself an engineer above anything else, which I thought was really weird. I mean, I, I couldn't figure out why he would say that. But then there's this one day and it's really taught me a lesson about the point of mixes where we had brought in this idea um, that was, it was simple. It was drums, bass, piano, and a vocal. I think that was it. It was just a quick little demo of an idea. And we took it to the studio and, and Dre was like, yeah, okay, I like this. And then he stood at the desk and he was telling his engineer for about 20 minutes, I kid you not, you know, turn this knob this much, turn this knob that much. And nothing was changing. And, I, and this thing's playing on loop. And I sort of started to think, has he lost his mind? Like, or is he <laughs> like, on us? Like, what is going on here? And then finally, it was almost like magic. Like this last knob was turned. And, and this then, demo bam. sounded like a hit. And I couldn't tell you what was different about it. And that's when I just sort of thought, oh, my God. And the other thing, too, with him is his work ethic is unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's all, it's all in the mix, isn't it? It is the mastering and the mix. Is that what makes a song sound like it was recorded uh, with a toaster or whether it's been done in a professional studio? I think the mixing, I produce music myself. And at the end, we're always sitting there with Isotope and with the whole plugins, trying to get that radio sound, that big sound. And that's, you know, you spend more time doing that. And I have to like close my eyes so I can't see the, the waveform and just listen to it. Then I go to bed or I go for a, a cigarette or I go for a meal and I come back and listen to it again. And I've, I've deleted so many files, which I thought were great, but weren't when you listen the second time. And all of a sudden, then you just said, said that's it. That's it. It looks great. The waveform's good. The sound's good. But you spent like three much time as three more yeah 300 percent more time on yeah. the mix than you than you did on the production itself so are you like that as well are you very very a perfectionist oh absolutely uh, absolutely and it's funny you talk about closing your eyes because um i do find that i mean of course you know your brain lies to you mm -hmm. right i mean we we know this is perception it's not always it's not always trustworthy so i'll find that I really do have to, sometimes I will just turn off my monitor yes. just to listen because it's amazing, especially when you're programming drums or something like that. I'll look at the MIDI and if I'm listening to it and looking at the MIDI and my eyes are telling me this is right, it sounds right. But then yeah. I turn it off or I'll go make a cup of coffee and I'll hear in the background, I'll be like, one of those hits is off. I know yeah. it's off, <laughs> you know? And it's just, it's, you know, this visual aspect you need to, be aware of how it can fool you. And also that your ears get tired. That's something I learned from Khalil, uh, who also was kind enough to take me under his wing as a producer yes. when I moved to LA. I mean, that was to me the, the biggest thing I got out of moving to Los Angeles was my studio was next to his. He gave me a room in his complex. And for four years, I basically got a crash course from one of the best, probably the best producer, except for Dr. Dre that I've ever worked with. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, let's use the big G word, the Grammys. I mean, you know, that is amazing. What happened there? What was that like for a feeling to realize I didn't only make hit records, but oh my God, I'm getting the biggest prize in the whole goddamn world. Yeah, that, that two, well, one big thing happened, which was that suddenly my parents thought I had a job. <laughs> oh, you had to get the Grammy to, to convince your parents. Well, yeah, especially the extended family, you know, the, the, the right. next Christmas, suddenly they're like, oh, so you're actually a musician? We always thought that was code for bum. <laughs> 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 but no, I remember it was, it was quite funny because um, I didn't go <laughs> for the first year when, when uh, Recovery was nominated because... I, I don't know, some sort of silly superstition. I somehow thought if I went, he, it wouldn't win. Oh no, that's so it, sad. If you get if you get invited to the Grammys, you have to go. 
And well, I went the second time. No, I'm not going to go. Well, yeah, yeah, but you should have gone the first time. That's the great. I should have gone the first time. But I'll never forget being in a bar downtown Toronto with my friends. Just sort of like watching. This, oh, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win. Oh, yeah. And then when when I did, um, my friends sort of all jumped at me and actually broke two of my ribs. <laughs> so... Oh my God! So you nearly you nearly died. You nearly bled to death. <laughs> then your friends break your ribs. Oh my God! This is a dangerous All the name business music. you're in. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but no. So, that, that oh was, my God! I imagine the people play, sat yeah. in the bar and your friends are jumping at you because you just want to grab you. And probably everybody else in the room has no idea what the hell is going on. And then somebody says, "Are you okay? What happened?" Yeah, I'm fine. I just want to grab me. Well, you know, Torontonians are very sort of a subtle bunch. And so it was quite funny because literally nobody believed me. <laughs> well, I wouldn't because if, if you didn't go to, no, all right, <laughs> I, I'm sitting next to this guy in a bar. He's drinking a beer and he's watching a TV. Then he gets his ribs broken. And then he says, oh, I just won a Grammy. Everyone's like thinking, yeah, right, dude. Because if you had won the Grammy, you would be at the Grammy Awards. <laughs> Presumably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So that must've been a really cool feeling. It, it was cool, although, you know, it's, it's, this is a cynical thing to say, is that at the end of the day, I mean, once you achieve something like that, I mean, it is obviously something I'm, I'm so grateful and thankful for. And I kind of felt like I was in the club now, you know, it's okay, right. cool. Got one of these, and then I got a second one, which is also really cool, because now I've got two of them, which is like a different club. Uh, but I'll tell you the most useful thing about Grammys is visa applications right that's that how you very... go to berlin germany i brought them I'm to the appointment. grammy winner yeah <laughs> yeah no further questions sir welcome no, to the it, it, it really Republic helps. of germany well because i mean that's it it's just it's just it's I, to me i look at them just sort of the same way that sort of i don't have the many any of them in here they're all in the hallway because i sort of right. like yeah. the idea of the studio all everybody's awards are in the hallway of this studio. Yes. They're like the group effort kind of thing. Um, but I, I didn't used to put any of this stuff up at all until I kind of had this idea that, you know, it's not really about bragging. It's uh, sort of, and again, not, not a fair comparison, but you know, the way a doctor has their certificate up on the wall. Yes. They're not bragging about it. <laughs> They're just showing that they are in fact qualified. To, at a certain level to practice medicine. And that's sort right. of the way I see something like a Grammy is, is that I, I don't sit around thinking, ah, I'm the greatest. It's, there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of amazing people besides me that were involved in making those records and, and all that. But I'm just really thankful to have been a part of them. Right, so you got your visa in, in, in Germany through your Grammys. What was it like working with Pink? Because I mean, you know, she, I imagine, I, I met her once, but not very long. I imagine she knows what she wants. And I bet, you know, if you don't do what she wants, she can, she can be quite talkative, probably. Well, yeah, I mean, she's very, very confident. And again, super talented. She has the talent to, to back it up. Um, it's a funny thing working with her where at the end of it, I mean, it was all so exciting. I mean, this is somebody, I'm, I'm a pretty relaxed guy. I don't know if it's a Canadian thing or what, but you know, she likes something, she's jumping around and she's excited and she's blasting and this and that. And it was fantastic and so great. But at the end of it, I once the session was over, I went home and I went to bed. I mean, I was so Tired. just mentally and emotionally exhausted. And I thought, my God, how does she function like that? But I'll tell you a, a funny story about Pink which is that we did, um, you know, I'm sure most people know this, that when you write a song for somebody, because the song that she ended up performing or, you know, recording of, of mine, I'd actually written in Toronto, which was funny. Uh, the other songs ended up being pitched to other people. Uh, but when you write a song for a big artist, the usual convention is that regardless of what they add to it, they will take 50% of the publishing. You know, this goes back to the days of Elvis, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, with Pink, we did the song, Here Comes the Weekend. And then I got the split sheet. And Pink's uh, share was 5%. 
And so I called my manager and said, okay, obviously there's been a mistake here. They forgot to put the zero. And he looked at it. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Don't sign that. Let me just get this thing straightened out. And he calls me back about an hour later. And he says, yeah, this is amazing. But apparently Pink came up writing songs for other people. She always hated that practice. She changed a few oh. words and felt she deserved 5%. And I thought, so no. let me get this right. The 95% went to you then. No, me and my co-writers, which were the new Royales. You know, so me wow, and Liz, that, that is, yeah. that is, that is not the normal way to do that, but that's quite no, so that's, to I me. Mean, that I mean, I was, was a sign. Yeah. Like uh, just integrity, you know, it's just really, you know, yeah. I'm amazed when people who can essentially abuse the system choose not to. Wow. So you you went from um, meeting, not meeting Eminem, but meeting Dr. Dre, then to Pink. And then I'm going to throw the name Celine Dion in, in, in the room. That's like three totally different things that you do. So I mean, Celine Dion, I mean, I, you know, she's best known for My Heart Will Go On, which doesn't sound <laughs> like Pink and doesn't sound like Eminem. So what was it like working with her or didn't you meet her either? No, I have not met her yet. Um... Although there's been several failed attempts at this point that were due to Corona, where she was supposed to be right. writing. But boy, I'll tell you about Celine Dion. Because A, yeah, I mean, it's obviously, it was a real pivot to write for her. Um, but that was very intentional because I, like you had, you had pointed out, it's my background isn't really hip hop. Uh, I've Obviously I've done quite a lot of it, but um, when I was in LA, I, I realized, boy, I'm really getting pigeonholed for this stuff that I've done. And I, I love it and it's great, but it's not really my passion. You know, right. I want to be able to do a lot of different things. This is what part of what I really like about being a songwriter and writing for other people is that you get to put on all these different hats, you know, try different yes. things. So then I sort of, the, the opportunity came along to pitch for Celine Dion, and, and you know how it is. I mean, it's it's thousands of people are pitching. They're, it's really just a crapshoot. You're chucking things at a wall. Um, so once again, I was I was with my friend Liz, um, and we were writing with another Canadian named Stefan Macchio, who had written some songs for Celine in the past. So there was a connection okay. there. Yes. Uh, but again, you know, that might put you a bit higher on the list, but it definitely doesn't mean you're going to get it. <laughs> but that it was an interesting thing because hopefully I'm not talking out of turn here and I won't get a, an angry phone call, but um, we had been told that they wanted a song that would represent the fact that her husband had just died. And this is one of the reasons I'm really proud about the song Courage is that that's very difficult to do because it obviously has to be specific enough for it to mean something to the artist. But if it's too on the nose, it'll really come off as disingenuous and like manipulative almost. Yeah. So at the time, my my stepfather was dying. And so oh. I sort of, and my mom's French Canadian. She's actually from, from not too far away from where Celine grew up. And so step one is I thought, okay, got to have a one word title that's the same word in French as it is in English, because yeah. that way it will appeal to, you know, both her Franco and Anglo fans. And then we started writing the song in my mind, I started thinking about how my, what my mother was going through because that was something that I could really get close to without being disingenuous. And Liz, you know, brought, wrote a lot of the lyrics as well. And she's just phenomenal. I mean, she taps in to things I can't understand, but the song came, came about and then I guess they heard it. And, uh, you know, you, you know how these things go as you hear like, Oh, they like it. And <clears throat> Oh, who knows what's going to happen. And then two months go by and, you don't hear, hear, hear anything, but then after about two or three months, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we heard, uh, well, actually it's going to be the name of the album and it's going to be the name of the tour. My and it, God. it's totally changed the way they're looking at the project. And now it's the courage project and all this. And I just thought, Oh my God, we got it. Um, but no, Celine has her team that she does vocals with. And so that's why I, I never met her. Neither Liz didn't go out either for it, but when she was supposed to be in Berlin, like they're such a classy bunch. I got a call from the manager saying, look, you know, you're going you're gonna to have dinner, this and that, you know, obviously Celine wants to meet you and it's just really lovely. And then of course it was all postponed, but following this pink story, Celine Dion 
has never taken 1% of publishing in her entire career. She considers herself a performer. She is not a writer and she doesn't pretend to be. And I just, when I heard that, I mean, I could not believe it. You want to talk about integrity. I mean, my God, I'm not honestly a huge Celine Dion fan, but I am a massive Celine fan of her. So she, what what she said actually was, I am not part of this idea that Eric uh, uh, made. Why should I? Why should I get money for it? He he did it. Let's pay the guy. I've got enough money anyway, and I can you know earn other royalties and and concerts and and TV shows. That is that is and I, you know that's something to tell you the truth that I have never heard. I thought the pink one was good with five, you know, uh, but when you get a split of zero. <clears throat> that's where the manager should start to get a bit sweaty because you think, okay, something's wrong here. Something's definitely wrong. Oh no, it's unbelievable. I mean, they are so classy. I mean, she even put out these videos on Instagram and Facebook and all this sort of stuff of her singing the vocals with the lyric sheet and it, the camera closes up on the writer's names on the top. And I just thought this is, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, I won't, I won't get into specifics, but obviously the background to these stories is all of the times that I've been ripped off and all the times that you get, you put in all the work and then suddenly there's two people you've never heard of who are on the splits. And, but if you want to get the cut, you've got to stay okay to it. I mean, that happens all the time. It's obviously, it does. right. It's an unregulated business. There's no real rules to how this happens. And so you kind of have to learn the way that things should go versus the way things do usually go. So when you have something like this happen, I mean, it's just, it's so rare. I mean, for me, I've been doing this since I was, you know, it's like 20 years. And yeah. those are the two stories where I've just been astounded. So what's next for you then? I mean, who would you like to write uh, for or compose for? I mean, what about things like Coldplay or, or, or bands like U2? Would that be something for you? Or, you know, to, just, well, to you make, know just to make, to go from Eminem to Pink to Celine Dion, maybe, maybe for... Some, some hard rock uh, metal band or something. <laughs> well, you know, it's okay. To be perfectly honest, this is what one of the ironies of what I do is, again, I'm not trying to disparage any of the people I've written for because I think they're all amazing. But the bands that I really love don't take outside songs. I mean, they don't, you know, they write their own music. So I'm never so going to get to work Who, who, who are the bands that you love? Oh, Radiohead, okay. That's Radiohead, yeah. uh, Kasabian. Oh, wow, yeah. I really love Kasabian. Um, and Coldplay is great, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, sort of indie rock bands, I guess, for a lack of a better word. Tame and Paula, I would absolutely love to work with Kevin, Kevin Parker. That That's something that the, you know, the way that it, that it in, in my life, at least, is that there's people you want to work with and it almost feels like there's an orbit and then something will come about and you're sort of like, oh, wait, okay, you're getting called. Like, I remember I almost worked with Jack White like this. Like it was very close. Right. And then something falls apart and it doesn't happen. And then maybe a year later, some other project comes up and your name is sort of put into it. So this has happened a few times with Kevin Parker and I really, I've got my fingers crossed. Right. Work out. But in the meantime, I'm working on several projects. I mean, I'm working on my own project, this thing called Lo-Fi Hero I'm really excited about. Yes. I've got a podcast with a guy named Craig Walker called The Cold Cast, where we are uh, interviewing, I mean, really top tier producers and musicians about, I mean, kind of like this, to be honest, uh, but it's yeah, based on yeah. five songs that changed your life. So that's the way we sort of go into it. And I've got a band with him as well. And we're, we're going to start touring and I've been producing those. But as I said, actually, you know, Full Circle is one of the reasons I came out here was that quite frankly, I mean, there's the term that I've always used is moonshot pitches right which is these really big things and I just thought you know I'd rather get to work with lesser known artists but be right. in the room with them and get to really connect with them and make just records that I'm really proud of and so that's what I've been doing and so I've been working with a lot of local people out here and been really enjoying it is Berlin uh, international enough to you know to, to hit the big markets or do you do you have to still stay connected to North America? I think at the moment, I mean, when you say international, if you, if you mean North America, then I, I think it will be there in about five years. That was okay. 
my guests because you know I also have the perspective of having been in North America. And Berlin is a bit of a question mark, but it is cool. People yeah. are interested. And that's the thing is that's how it starts, is it's cool. And you know, when I told Evan uh, Lambert, the, the president of, of Universal, that I was going to move here, I mean, I kind of thought he was going to wring my neck because, you know, I'd <laughs> been out there for three years. I just landed Celine. And yeah. we had a meeting where the point of the meeting was, see, I told you now things are really yeah. going to start happening for you out here. And I was like, actually, I'm going to move to Berlin. <laughs> and and he, t t to his credit, he, it took him about 10 seconds of silence to sort of process what I'd said to him. And then he said, okay, okay. It's close to London. It's close to Stockholm. It's the biggest market in Europe. Yes, it makes sense. Berlin's happening. Great. You're going to do great. Right. Yeah. So I really believe in the city and I, I really think it's just, especially, you know, and I don't want to get too, you know, get get off of the tangible things here but let's face it as a writer there is also inspiration and in this kind of a thing i mean it is a big part of what you do and i find this city and the vibe here just really really inspiring in which part of berlin are you if i may ask are you in the east or the old east or the or the west or in frederickshain or prenzlauer berg where, where you know the parties are well, kreuzberg. I, I, um, my studio is in kreuzberg which is where i am right now right. um i was living in lichtenberg and right now I'm in Mitte. Right. So you're you're not out on the outskirts where you have a big villa, but you're inside the, the pulsating part of Berlin where you can just get get out of the the, the, the flat and just walk into the next cool pub or restaurant or bar. Exactly. I, I'm in a tiny apartment again, you know, and, and it's a funny thing where there's, a, you know, there's a great Jack White, or I think it was a White Stripe song where there's not even any music. It's just a kick drum and him just singing this line. And it was just uh, when you're in a little room and you start to do something good, before you know it, you might find yourself in a bigger room. But when you're in that bigger room and it's not going like it should, maybe it's time to get back into that little room. Right. And, you know, I moved to this little apartment. I love it because it's in the middle of everything. And I just thought, yeah, I've got my studio. This is my little nest or I can just write up here. You know, I don't need bells and whistles, you know. That's an amazing story, an amazing career, and it's you know it was, it was really really inspirating for me to listen to you because I think you 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 know you you are a, a really nice person and you as you as you've explained it was quite a lot of luck and quite a lot of scary moments in your life but when you look back now you you maybe as your parents said you you finally made it you got a job so that was great. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show today, Eric. That was, as I said, that was uh, really motivating. And I think that's what the global icon is about, that we show people around the world that there are different ways to get from A to B. Uh, and uh, maybe the, the best thing that I can take out of this interview is you don't need a big room to be a big star. <laughs> exactly. Well, dude, thank you so much for having me, Rob. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. And uh, Yes, you too. The global icon. And when I'm when I'm in Berlin, uh, I'll give you a ring and then we'll go out and get some German beer. Beautiful. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Eric, all the best. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, man. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks for watching The Global Icon.